Hello, sociology students. This is Mrs. Politsky, and I have your notes for Chapter 7, Section 5, Crime and Punishment. So follow along. Here we go. Uh, anytime we talk about crime, it is an act that has been formally prohibited by law. And how we define a crime is probably going to do depend upon, you know, what uh, maybe a governmental body has labeled as a crime. So there are five fairly large categories for crime in the United States. Uh, the first type of crime is what we would call crimes of violence. And this could include things like robbery. Uh, anytime we talk about robbery, that is like the taking of property, but by force. So usually a weapon, or some kind of violent act is involved in this. Aggravated assault, meaning that someone is threatening another with maybe a weapon. Murder, which is kind of obvious because that is obviously very violent. And rape. Okay, all of these are usually crimes uh, that are going to be punished probably with a certain amount of severity, meaning that you're probably going to spend time incarcerated in a, a maybe a state penitentiary, or if it's a federal crime in a federal penitentiary. Okay, uh, maybe some lesser crimes. These would be crimes against property. It could be stealing, the taking of property, sometimes known as larceny. Okay, that could be done either by deception, or it could be done in such a way that uh, I take it without necessarily any force involved. Crimes like vandalism, uh, the destruction of property, or um, things of that nature would also be included in this. Uh, that could include like trespassing on land without permission, of course. Other crimes, uh, crimes without victims. Things like gambling, uh, depending upon the state that the person lives in. So in Nebraska, obviously we do not have uh, legalized gambling here in our state. So that would be a crime that a person could get in trouble for. Uh, prostitution, drug use, uh, curfew violations. So if there would be like martial law and you were out past the curfew time, uh, that would be something that could be punishable. Uh, the fourth category would be white-collar crimes. And these are usually crimes that are done within the business world. So tax evasion, um, toxic pollution, or um, you know, air pollution, water pollution that would be in part of, kind of involved in that. Copyright infringement, meaning that you are illegally um, downloading uh, materials or maybe um, falsifying a copyrighted document for your own um, enhancement, meaning for you to, to make money off of stock man manipulation, um, basically uh, that could include things like insider trading, knowing what's going to happen to a stock before uh, the market opens and, and buying or selling so that you can make money or, or prevent yourself from losing money. Uh, price fixing, which is usually done by uh, a number of people who are like in the same industry, uh, setting prices so that you can uh, either create a monopoly or to make a profit or fraud. Fraud is basically trying to deceive others, um, perhaps by lying or such. So uh, trying to sell a vehicle that's been in an accident and uh, portraying that the car has not been in an accident or uh, selling property that has been stolen. That certainly would be under the category of fraud. Okay. Last one is what we would call organized crime. And this is large scale organization of uh, professional criminals. A lot of times we talk about the mafia, but even drug cartels would fall into this as well. Okay. So who are the stereotypical criminal types? Okay. So stereotypes are not necessarily always what you're going to find is your your real criminals, but this is what society kind of tries to portray. Um, and it's not necessarily always true. Uh, I think if you look at, you know, maybe how um, TV programs and maybe how things are reported within the news, uh, you might assume that all criminals are young urban males. 
But the truth is, uh, when we talk about, you know, criminals, they can come in all ages. Uh, they can be both rural and urban. They can also be female as easy as they can be male. So uh, it's important to, to kind of, you know, not necessarily label or gen, uh, use a generalization uh, to assume that people that are young and urban and male are the ones only committing the crimes because they can be committed by anyone. Whites commit roughly 67% of crimes compared to roughly 30% of African Americans. What I think is interesting is if you look at the number of people who are incarcerated, meaning people who are behind bars, um, you could almost flip-flop those percentages. It seems like there are far more African Americans and minorities uh, that are serving time compared to whites. And, and certainly if you were um, someone who was looking at the conflict theory, you would probably say this is a this is a problem because uh, it's not necessarily representative of who's actually committing the crimes. But it also might show where the resources are. Obviously, um, juries and and perhaps uh, the availability of legal counsel uh, seems to be favoring uh, whites over minorities. The juvenile justice system. When we talk about young people, this is the third largest category of criminals in the U.S. Uh, up until about the 1960s, juveniles who were charged with crimes had very few rights and were not necessarily protected by the same legal safeguards uh, provided adult offenders. In other words, if you were young, you might have been treated more harshly. You know, that has changed a little bit. And I'll, I'll mention that as we get down to the bottom of this section here, but um, the laws for juvenile offenders are less specific than those for adults. So incorrigible and ungovernable children, these are kids who are kind of wild and and who are uh, not necessarily going to listen to authorities or their parents, uh, who associate with immoral or vicious persons the definition of a juvenile defender or offender. Uh, juveniles sometimes remain in custody longer than adults charged for the same crime. Some of that is because of the fact that they're younger and this is one way to control them. Sometimes juveniles have been denied equal protection under the law. And that's a big one. That's something I want to mention here. Uh, the guard against this courts must now guarantee the same rights, legal rights and privileges as a adult defendants. But because we've done a lot more research on, let's say, the, the psychological factors like the brain development, um, we're finding that, you know, years ago, it might have been easy to um, take a juvenile who might have committed a serious crime like murder and charge them uh, with the with the crime the same way we would do an adult, meaning like we might sentence them uh, to death or we might uh, give them a life in prison without parole uh, kind of sentencing. Uh, we can't do that anymore. Uh, the, the U.S. Supreme Court has ruled in cases uh, that basically says that you know, you have to look at the age and look at the developmental factors of these individuals. Along that same note, individuals who are adults who might have uh, IQs that are um, below the number 70, which is uh, usually the, the line that we consider to be developmentally challenged. Uh, you cannot give them, you know, a life without parole or a death sentence either, uh, because they may not understand the full extent of what they've done, okay, and the consequences of that. So we have to take a lot of factors um, in, into consideration when we talk about juveniles and, and those people who are uh, developmentally challenged in making sure that they receive equal protection under the law. Juvenile delinquency, a juvenile delinquent is basically behavior that includes deviance that can only be committed to young people, such as failing to attend school. Okay. Um, some school districts actually have truant officers. These are uh, law enforcement officers who are assigned to just make sure that kids show up to school. Sometimes they get a, a ride uh, with a, an officer or a deputy uh, to ensure that they're attending. Uh, fighting in school. Uh, some again, some schools have um, 
officers that actually are within the school building itself to um, to crack down on this kind of fighting. Uh, also, things like drinking and smoking underage, which are not necessarily um, school related, but they they are um, activities that certainly are in violation of the law. And, and again, uh, these would be things that would be handled primarily through a juvenile justice system. All right, corrections. This is the, anytime we talk about corrections is how we're going to treat those people who have been tried uh, within a court and punished or sentenced to a type of punishment. And so when we talk about corrections, sometimes may be done for retribution. In other words, to punish the offender, uh, it's revenge on behalf of the victim in society. So when an individual is sentenced to to like a capital punishment like death, um, a lot of times it is done for the victim or the victim's family or uh, to say something as far as society is concerned. Granted, um, does it deter people from actually committing violent crimes? Uh, it probably doesn't because we still have people committing murder and we still have executions. Um, I don't think anything has really changed here. So there is that argument for that. Uh, the second would be deterrent. Uh, through punishment, corrections can deter the offender. So if you get basically um, arrested for a crime and sentenced, uh, maybe in the future this would prevent you from you know, one day going out and committing the same act again, or to commit or having others who know you commit that same act. Uh, incapacitation, this is basically uh, the imprisonment of somebody. This is imposing restrictions on freedom for the offenders, and it's done to prevent further crimes. Incapacitation can be done in a variety of different ways. It could actually mean incarcerating someone in a prison, and that could be, you know, depending upon. Um, the nature of the crime that would probably determine how long a person would be behind bars. But it could also be done um, basically, you know, kind of in-house. So an ankle monitor um, or checking in with a parole officer and being subjected to uh, random drug testing and things like that as a way to kind of prevent you or the offender from um, going places or um, associating in activities that have gotten you into trouble. Another issue, and this is one that we don't necessarily uh, always think about, but it is something that uh, when we send people to um, prison, we do hope, and that is rehabilitation, um, reforming the offender, providing them uh, skills, and that could be, you know, work skills, it could be educational skills uh, that would keep them from going back and committing crimes again. In other words, to make them law abiding for the rest of their life. Uh, many prisons throughout our nation actually have programs that are set up um, in house to, um, to teach those people who are incarcerated some kind of skill. And that could be anything from making furniture or, um, you know, the old standard making license plates for states and things like that. Um, it could be, um, you know, learning how to do mechanical work and, and things of that nature. But some of that is so that they can leave prison at some point in time and go out into the work world and have a stable life. The fifth one, uh, this is known. If I can move our item here, there we go. Recidivism, which is this idea of individuals who have been incarcerated uh, for a crime and then, you know, supposedly have served their time and gone back out and repeated that same crime again and been convicted for for it. Um, this does happen. I mean, we have people who are. Um, basically repeat offenders. And that's something that is of concern for a lot of states. Uh, we're kind of hoping that, you know, through corrections, we can prevent that from happening, but it does occur occasionally. And then finally, uh, total institution. You know, this is where all aspects of an offender's life are absolutely controlled. 
truly the purpose of corrections is to kind of do some of this is to make sure that um, we have controls over what the person is doing on a day to day basis. Um, prison provides a certain routine. You know, there's um, a routine for, you know, eating and a routine for for your um, your you know, your cleaning habits and, and such and your uh, activity schedules and such. So, you know, for some people, that routine of being, you know, institutionalized uh, can provide a certain amount of stability that maybe was lacking in their lives beforehand. All right. The American criminal justice system. Um, police, for the most part, have the most control over who is arrested for a crime, and they've got to use discretion, um, which has a raised concern about controversial issues of racial profiling. So if, you know, an officer uh, happens to be spending more time in neighborhoods where there are minorities, are those neighborhoods um, seeing higher levels of arrest opposed to neighborhoods that are primarily uh, Caucasian or such. Another issue to think about are the courts. Uh, courts determine um, whether or not the accused is guilty or innocent. Um, they can assign the punishment. When we talk about the court system, though, a lot of people assume that if you are arrested, you're probably always going to have a trial. But roughly 90% of all cases that go to the courts are usually settled outside of the court through things like plea bargaining and, and such. Uh, only, you know, 10% of the cases actually do go to trial. Uh, another issue, again, corrections. This can include everything from probation, uh, imprisonment, parole. It serves four functions for the retribution, deterrence, rehabilitation, and social protection. And finally, if we can move this, maybe, there we go, our juvenile justice system. This applies to offenders younger than 18. So in the state of Nebraska, our age of majority is actually 19. So that would basically fall, you know, below that. Um, this guarantees that juvenile defenders or defendants have the same rights and privileges as adults and often um, providing them more services that can be available. All right, thank you very much.